Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's a good morning to be together, isn't it? I think there's a lot of good food downstairs, too, for those that can stay. All right. Well, let me begin with this statement. When God called his prophets in the Old Testament, it often caught them by surprise. They never expected to serve in this capacity. And some were reluctant, like this example. And this comes from the prophet Jeremiah. And this is a very, I guess you could say, a very revealing statement that he writes about himself. Okay, listen. Okay. The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Okay. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. Does that sound familiar? I mean, but we might not say young. We might say whatever it is that's on our minds. But he says, I'm too young. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young. For you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people. For I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today, I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. You know, when I hear Jeremiah's experience there, it makes me think of this. God makes no mistakes. Would you agree with that? Okay, God makes no mistakes in who he calls. Would you agree with that? And God makes no mistakes in who he calls and what he assigns them to do. Would you agree with that? I would too. So I guess at this point we have to say, let us learn from this example to be faithful to God in what he has chosen for us to do. And then I'm going to ask Dwayne Caden if you'd open us in a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you for this beautiful day. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, our salvation. Amen. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who works in us and through us. And we thank you that whatever job you have for us, you will give us the tools and the strength to do it. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dwayne. So our hymn that we're going to look at is, let's go to hymn number 680. Hymn number 680. When you find your place at number 680, you can join me in standing. Okay, number 680. We'll sing the whole song.
see a young man with a birthday coming up. Eli, you've got a birthday coming up, right? Okay, does Grandma know how old? Yeah. How old are you going to be, Eli? 14. 14! Wow! Oh, you know, I just learned a good story this morning, earlier before anybody came, that Grandma and Grandpa from Tennessee showed up unannounced. That's a pretty great birthday present, isn't it? They showed up unannounced, and I got it on a good source that Eli was just tickled to death to see Grandma and Grandpa all the way from Tennessee. He was actually in bed, he had gone to sleep for the evening, and he was wakened up to come down and see this wonderful visit, and he was just thrilled to death. So, isn't that great? What a great birthday present. So, Eli, happy birthday and many, many more. Okay, um, if you've got your prayer list and you turn it over, you can see the announcements that I am referring to. The ladies' outing to Hobby Lobby, that's coming up next Saturday. Um, you're going to meet out here at 10 a.m., and then head up there. And then you there's a sign-up in the back so everybody knows exactly who's coming so that they won't leave anybody behind, all right? So Hobby Lobby, it's a great place to go. It's, it's actually, I enjoy going there. Does that tell you anything? It's really a great place to go. And I enjoy going there. And, and I always find something interesting every time I go in that place. And so, yeah, so uh, ladies will have a fabulous time. Okay, and then, of course, today is our harvest dinner after the service. Everything's looking good. Oh, it's all Everything's all ready. There's plenty of seats. I think it's going to be a wonderful meal. So, yeah. Okay, shoebox, bulletin board. Uh, I need to tell you this, and that is that every week there's things being added to the bulletin board for needs. So that means you need to check it every week and see if there's something else you can contribute. Okay, because if we're going to get to 180 boxes, it's going to take a lot of merchandise. So, again, look and see each week. Uh, and if there's something else you can get, help us out. The other thing is, if you cannot get out and get items, some of the folks in the congregation will give us money to go shop for them. And that's acceptable, too. Okay, so if you... Huh? <laughs> okay. That's my bashful wife. <laughs> okay, so anyways, uh, yeah, so if you get if you can contribute finances that way for us to shop for you, that's appreciated also. Okay, and then offering for hurricane relief is today. Uh, again, eight days of hope is our designation that we'll be contributing to. And I put back on the table there a little bit of uh, right from them as to how the ministry got started and what they do and everything. And so back there for your information to pick up and read about a very good organization who does wonderful ministry for the Lord. The best thing I like about them is that whenever they go in any location that's a disaster, they park at a church. They, they set up shop right in a church parking lot because they want everybody in, the, in that they're serving to know that this is connected to the church in the area, which I think is a wonderful way to promote the church within the, or, within the area as a place of hope. And so that's what they do. They go and set up their operation in a church parking lot to do the ministry they do in disaster areas. Okay, so I don't think I have any more announcements there to, uh, to share, okay, except uh, I do have a praise. Last week we mentioned Genevieve was in the hospital. Genevieve is here today. Amen, huh? So it's, it's good to see her back with us. Okay, so let's go to our greeting hymn, okay? Let's go to number 681. 681. And then if you're visiting with us, you'll probably wonder, greeting, you know, what are you talking about? 
Okay, after we sing this hymn, we greet one another. And we don't usually stay in our seats. We move around and interact and just welcome each other. That's what we do, okay? So if you found 681, join me in standing. We'll sing both of the verses all the way through, and then we'll greet one another. <laughs>
What time do you get there to get there? See.
than me. I think I might have been about seven years old, to be honest. And my answer, surprisingly, was this. I want to help people. And he didn't say anything in return, but simply smiled and nodded to affirm my response. And I have to admit, as a young child, I didn't have any idea how to fulfill that purpose or what path would get me there. And this question asked of us as young children is not much different than asking ourselves as adults, what is my ultimate purpose in life and how am I going to get there? Unsaved people usually talk about, well, money, possessions, a right person to meet, a few nice kids as opposed to having bad kids, and an easygoing retirement to do what I really want to do. The problem in this scenario is Christ. He has a way of crossing our path and changing everything about us. And then our best laid plans are no longer the best anymore. This is what happened to a group of people living in Thessalonica who had their own purpose laid out before them and how to get there all figured out too. Now what do we do when what we thought was a grand purpose is no longer grand? Well, I think Paul knows the answer. And he's going to share it with them and with us. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we want to go to verse 11. Okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we want to look at verse 11. just verse 11 to start with. Here's what the apostle writes. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. So what do we do when what we thought was a grand purpose is no longer grand anymore? The first step as what he's written here is to ask God. Ask God for guidance. Lost people will often say, well, what good would that do? You see, they view God as distant. They view God as uninterested in the daily affairs of this life. And to be honest, I think they prefer it that way too. But Paul reminds us that God isn't distant because he's chosen to take on the role of father to us. How close is he as the father to us? Well, I'd like to start with an illustration about the words spoken by God as Moses described them. And this is what he said, speaking about the words of God. They are very close at hand, in your hearts, and on your lips, so obey them. So if I understand this right, the spoken words of God are as close as our own words in our mouths, and our own thoughts in our minds. Well, if his words are that close, then how close is God's presence to us as the Father? Well, here's something Jesus said. I will only reveal myself to those who love me and obey me. The Father will love them too, and we will come to them and live with them. According to Jesus, he, meaning God in heaven, lives with us as a loving father. And that makes me think back to the times when I was just a little boy at home in the process of growing up and I had a dad, a loving dad in the home that was always there. That's the picture of God moving into our lives. He's a loving father that's always there. What does a loving father like this do? Well, here's the answer that Jesus gave to his disciples. Listen to this. This is interesting. The words I say are not my own, but are from my father who lives in me. 
and he does his work through me. Just believe it that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe it because of the mighty miracles you have seen me do. So Jesus is saying that he and the Father did everything together as a team to achieve one purpose. A loving Father works with his children to help them develop, grow, and live with a proper purpose in life. This is what my earthly father tried to do for me. And if he would do that, then what would our heavenly father do for us? Well, again, Jesus supplies the answer. Here's what he said. You men who are fathers, if your boy asks for bread, do you give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, do you give him a snake? If he asks for an egg, do you give him a scorpion? And then his answer is emphatic, of course not. And if even sinful persons like yourselves give children what they need, don't you realize that your heavenly father will do at least as much and give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him. What is the Holy Spirit to us? Well, here again, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit who is truth comes, he shall guide you into all truth. For he will not be presenting his own ideas, but will be passing on to you what he has heard. Isn't this the guidance that we need in our lives? To find our purpose. What would you say? I would say yes. That's what I need to know my purpose. <clears throat> Guidance. Paul says. Not only do we look. To God the Father for guidance. But we also look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And why is that? Well Jesus said very simply. I am the way. The truth. And the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So the path to the loving Father is through the loving Son of God. Jesus gives us direction, as in the proper way to get to the loving Father. He gives us the truth about the loving Father that we need to know. And He gives us new life with the loving Father that we have never, ever had before. I'd say Jesus is good at what he does. And why does he do this for people like us? Why does Jesus do this? He says, I'm the good shepherd. And you see, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. What's the real reason behind this action of giving himself? For us. Well, he said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I'd say it's because he loves us so much that he gives his life so we could know his father. I like that. So we not only receive guidance from the loving father, guidance from the loving son, but also in what is known as spiritual leaders placed in our lives by the Godhead. Let's go back and read that verse 11 again. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. Paul, a spiritual leader, wanted to return to them. To do what? Well, back up to verse 10. Right there in the middle of the verse, he says, that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. He wanted to return to help them mature in their faith so they could live with godly purpose in life. 
Solomon wrote something that applies quite well to spiritual leaders in our lives. This is what he said. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You see, followers of Christ need spiritual leaders. Why? God has established the godly counsel of spiritual leaders as a safety net for his children to have in life. To avoid pitfalls that lead to what? Disaster. Sometimes walking through life is like walking a tightrope. But it sure helps to have spiritual leaders all around us to help us what? Stay on the right path. Amen? Amen. Stay on the right path. Now, King Solomon adds this thought. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Without spiritual leaders in our lives, we can easily find what? Disappointment. And less thought out purposes. But with the help of spiritual leaders, a godly purpose can be established, which does not lead to what? Disappointment. Now listen to this very profound truth stated by the Apostle Paul. Okay? While we're on this subject. Jesus gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, that's what Jesus did. He put human leaders on the earth for his people. God knew. So now we just have to ask this question. Are we taking advantage of this God-given human resource in our lives as God intended? Well, how do we do that? Well, we do this by listening to instruction when it's offered. We do this by talking with them concerning the issues in our lives. We do this by asking for help and accepting help when it's offered. We do this in hearing them pray for us in our presence. Now that we know about these resources intended to give us guidance, then what is the path to our ultimate purpose in life. What is the pathway to that ultimate purpose in life? Well, look at verse 12. The apostle writes this, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. The path. What is the path? It is the God of love increasing our ability and our capacity to love others, whether they are in his family or not in his family. What are we talking about here? Well, all of us have people we don't like by nature. Would you agree with that? I've seen a few go... Is nobody looking? Okay. All right. For example, some might say, I don't like kids. Is that a problem? It is if you take the words of Jesus seriously. Because he said, unless you turn to God from your sins 
and become as little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, anyone who humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And any of you who welcomes a little child like this because you are mine is welcoming me and caring for me. But if any of you causes one of these little ones who trusts in me to lose his faith, it would be better for you to have a millstone tied to your neck and to be thrown into the sea. So if I understand this right, how we treat children is a direct reflection on our love for Jesus. Because he said, how you receive children is equal to how you receive me. Okay, you got me there. But maybe somebody else would stand and say, you know, I can't stand old people. <laughs> old people. Then what would we say in that regard? We would say, well, then you know your love could stand some expansion. <laughs> your love needs to be increased. Well, how about this? Maybe we would rather spend all our time with Christians and we would shun all lost people everywhere. Then the truth is our love is way too small and it's way too narrow. Well, does this mean we need to love those ugly and mean sinners who treat us wrongly? And the answer is yes. This is exactly what Jesus meant when he said, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They that be whole don't need a physician, but they that are sick. You know, I have to admit, humanly, I think it's very easy to hate and dislike others. It's not easy to love and to like others. And John the Apostle wrote, Dear friends, let us practice loving each other. For love comes from God. And those who are loving and kind show that they are the children of God. And that they are getting to know Him better. But if a person isn't loving, and if a person isn't kind, it shows that he doesn't know God. For God is love. Amen. So is there anybody we dislike or hate? News for us. God wants us to love them instead. But how? Well, we can't do it in our own power. But God can do it through us if we will yield to him. That is why Paul wrote here, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all. Well, now that we know what path to take going forward, then what is the ultimate purpose in our lives? Look at verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his sins. I think the ultimate purpose could be explained as follows by these words spoken by Jesus. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so to be. This means our ultimate purpose is to love exactly as Jesus taught us so that he will find us Loving others down here when he comes. That's it. How does this help toward the establishment of a blameless heart? 
as Paul was speaking of here, having a blameless heart. I think that's a good thing, to have a blameless heart. So how does this help towards getting that blameless heart? Well, listen to an explanation that Paul wrote in another letter. It's very interesting. He writes, pay all your debts, accept the debt of love for others. Never finish paying that. For if you love them, you will be obeying all of God's laws, fulfilling all his requirements. If you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself, you will not want to harm or cheat him or kill him or steal from him. And you won't sin with his wife or want what is his or do anything else the Ten Commandments say is wrong. All ten are wrapped up in this one. To love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love does no wrong to anyone. That's why it fully satisfies all of God's requirements. It's the only law you need. So if I understand this right, having a heart full of God's love leads to a clear conscience concerning others. How? It causes us to have the right actions, or you would say the right conduct towards them. Isn't this the ultimate purpose in life in pleasing God by actions that demonstrate his love for others? Isn't that the ultimate? And I would say, yes. You see, John the Apostle wrote, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What keeps us loving like this? Well, I think according to what the Apostle was trying to say in verse 10, it is having a mature faith. That's essential. You see, a grown-up faith leads to a grown-up love for others. That's it. What is the ultimate reward for living this way? It's being presented as holy to our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. You see, Jesus said, whoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. How do we start to confess Jesus before others? Here it is. It's by the love we show to them first. You see, no one wants to hear what we have to say until they know how much we love and care for them. Our purpose in this life is to love like Jesus and thus make his job of introducing us to his Father in heaven very easy for him to do. Very easy. Let me ask you a question going back to the beginning. What do we want to be when we grow up in the faith? What do we want to be when we grow up in the faith? <coughs> Maybe we would all agree this. We want to be like Jesus. Hmm? We want to be like Jesus. How are we going to get there from here? We are going to love all people. Just like Jesus did. Whether they are young or old. Whether they are part of God's family or not a part. Whether they are kind or unkind to us. And again, why do we want to do this? 
we want the Savior to be pleased. To say to his father, are you ready? Here are these folks I've been telling you about. From Rock Glen. They have led many others to know us, Father, by loving those people as we wanted them to do. Wouldn't it be marvelous that we stand in heaven and Jesus gets us all together and he says, come with me, I'm going to introduce you to my Father, the people from Rockland. And what's their characteristic? They love. They love like I've always wanted them to do. Isn't that marvelous? A marvelous introduction like that? It gives us a purpose to live for, doesn't it? That's the ultimate purpose. To make Jesus happy. And to make him so happy, he has no reservations about saying, you, 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 come with me. You're going to meet the Father. I want to introduce you. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we come before you right now. We are just amazed how sometimes... When we look into the Bible and, and we look at just small glimpses like this, only a few verses, somehow it seems that even only a few verses can be packed with so much treasure and gems for us to mine and dig out and find how it applies to our hearts and our souls. We realize what a great father you are to give us the treasure of the Bible that we hold in our hands. But not only that, to give us your son, who opened the door for us to experience new life, new life with you. What a gem that is. But then not only that, but a door has been opened for us to serve you, to serve you in a way that pleases you. And that is exciting also. As we think about the topics that we've looked at this morning, it's easy for us at times to look at ourselves and go, oh boy, I don't think I'm doing very well in loving others. I'm having a hard time with it. Well, the good news is, Father, that you care for us so much that you want us to develop and grow that you'll do everything in your power to help us to overcome whatever it is in our lives that's an obstacle. And we are so thankful that you're a loving Father like that. We would ask for forgiveness for the times in which we've not been a very good example to others in how we've loved. Maybe we've gotten into arguments, discussions, and things that were not very pleasant. It really didn't show love. Father, forgive us for those expressions that didn't please you. Renew our hearts and minds that we would continue to strive to keep going in the right direction and loving in the way that you would have us to love. I give you glory, honor, and thanks for your presence here among us. In Jesus' name. For the last hymn, we want to go to number 685. Number 685. And when you get there, we're going to sing the first three verses. Okay, the first three verses, number 685. You can join me in standing when you find your place.
not even 11 o'clock. That's good, right? All right. All right, so Donald, if you'd lead us in prayer and also ask the blessing on the food downstairs, please. Lord, we come to give thanks for the beautiful message that you have given to us this day. We ask you, Lord, to let this love of yours increase within our hearts that we may share it to others, Lord, who has a need for love and understanding. And we thank you for all that you do with that love for us and that we, we do share with others. And thank you. We also, Lord, we ask you to be with Israel. Israel and the Israelites, bless them, lift them up spiritually. Convict their hearts, Lord, to just be a day of salvation for each and every one and call upon your name and receive you into their life as their Lord and Savior. We thank you for that. We also ask you to bless America. Be with President Biden and Vice President Harris. Bless them, Lord, lift them up spiritually. And Lord, convict your hearts. Today would be a day that they would come and repent of their sins and ask you to come into their life and receive your salvation. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. Thank you.